Hey everybody, hi, welcome. It's time for Atomic Radio Hour, the post-nuclear podcast. How are you? You look fantastic. As always, hope you guys are well. I have some exciting things to talk about tonight. We officially live in a world that is getting Fallout on Prime, Fallout TV, the Fallout show. It's getting a second season on screen. Ooh. On screen should be the, the official screenshot uh, I'm getting this directly from Kyle. I've seen it all over Twitter this past week. I recorded last week's episode and this happened like immediately after. So, my bad. <laughs> uh, but we're getting it, which I thought it was already renewed for a season two. I didn't think that this was news when it had come out. I thought this was just something we knew was going to happen. Um, but it's exciting knowing that it's going to happen, that we are definitely getting a season two. It just sucks that I'm predicting we're going to wait until 2025 to get it. Uh, they wrote it during the lockdowns. So 21, 20, 2020, 21, around that time, and uh, then took two years to shoot. I saw recently Ella Parnell's Instagram said that she had been sitting on behind the screenshots for like two years. So I'm assuming it's going to be about another two years, probably take about six to eight months to write. And then from there, the filming process and what have you. I have a sneaking suspicion that if you're watching this, you may have just maybe been playing Fallout 4's next gen update. In the comments below, tell me what you like about it, what you don't like about it, what you were looking forward to, what you weren't, because I'm really curious to know how other people are feeling about it. I have been saying in the past few episodes, and even on Vault Boys, which link in the description of Vault Boys, if you want to see how me and my friend Kyle feel about Fallout on Prime, I've been saying that I just got my hands on a copy, digital copy, of Fallout 4 uh, Game of the Year Edition, so it has all the DLC on Xbox, it was like $10. Uh, so I'm really excited to go back. I really want to play through New Vegas first, and then I'm going to go to four. I'm kind of, I've kind of been playing them in like in order, more or less. I guess chron chronologically that's in order as well, but also the order that in which they came out. I've been playing them because I just went through three. Now I'm going to go through New Vegas, and then I'm going to go through four. But let me know what you think about it because I'm really curious to see the the new weapons and stuff. Uh, there's like these makeshift weapons, which I'm always interested to see because I feel like it's something that should show up more. I feel like we should see more. Like one of them looked like a nail gun, which I know is a weapon in New Vegas, but I feel like it's something we should see more of. There's like a big leaf blower that looks fun. All of the Enclave stuff looks interesting. I, I don't know if it's going to have actual like quest application or if it's just there to be there. Uh, either way, let me know. Let me know if it's running better for you. I'm probably going to not play it on 60 frames. I'm probably going to play it on 30 and then play it on 4K. But who knows? Maybe I'll do 60 frames at 1080. I don't really care. I, I don't know. I'm one of those people that like doesn't care about... 60 frames, I really don't care about 4K. Something can look good at, at 1080 for me, but... Or even 2K. If they could do 2K at 60 in, like, the middle there, I'll probably just do that. But let me know what you're thinking about it. Let me know if you're having fun. Let me know what you're doing. Let me know what kind of character you're building. Are you playing a male, a female? I think when I play Fallout 4, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a power armor build. Like, a heavy weapons, like, just big Gatling guns, uh, big laser gatling like stuff like that missile launchers I think i'm gonna go for like a heavy weapons power armor wearing thing build and then i'm gonna side with i think the railroad either the railroad or the institute i'm not sure i haven't really thought it through but i know not the brotherhood just somebody else what we're talking about how great it is to be a fallout fan at this particular point in time this should come out before the promotion ends. I believe the promotion ends on the 27th or the 29th of, of April, 2024, the year of your Lord. I got it the other day because I've been wanting to play 76. Actually, on Vault Boys, Kyle and I, I asked Kyle, I go, Kyle, when are we playing, when are we playing 76? And he's like, I'll play 76 with you. I've been trying to get a small crew together. I know Kyle would be down. I might have two or three other friends that'll be down to try it at least to go back and try it again. Uh, but if you have Amazon Prime, Amazon Prime is currently giving away a free copy of 76. All you gotta do is activate your Prime Gaming, go in, there's an option for PC code and Xbox code. I have my code, downloaded it the other night. What sucks is there's no single player whatsoever, so I can't even just jump on and like make a character. As far as I know, I have to like have Xbox Live, which I just don't have. Um, I don't have 
live services. I don't have PlayStation Plus and I don't have Xbox Live. I don't really play multiplayer games anymore. And the only multiplayer games that I would want to play are free. Uh, Halo Infinite is free and Fortnite is free. I don't need the internet. I don't need an internet, sub internet subscription to play it. I just need an Xbox and a game download. Uh, so I don't have it, but it's one of those things that if we can get a schedule together, a nice fat schedule, I would love to uh, get a crew together and play and see what's been going on in Appalachia and be a little more familiar with that world. I also heard something today on a Mr. Matty Plays video that I thought was really interesting. Bethesda was considering taking down 76, like just calling it a day and being done with it. And then they made it a PlayStation Plus game. And it had a huge resurgence of players. And recently, I don't even know how the hell I didn't bring this up. Just the other day, I'll put the, the picture on screen. Ooh, ooh, which way? I'm, I'm like a weatherman. Everything's flipped. Um, on screen will be the picture that over a million people in one day were playing it. And I don't even think a million people in one day were playing it when it first came out. So Fallout is really in a renaissance right now. Uh, just, just a great time to be a fan. Hopefully some point soon we get news of like a Fallout 3 New Vegas remaster, maybe a port with, I mean, we don't really need a port with better graphics because we kind of already have that on Xbox. Be nice if PlayStation can get it too because all the framework essentially exists there. But what are you going to do? If they could update the graphics, if they could update some of the, the, the rendering abilities, if they could add ray tracing or something into Fallout 3, just kind of beef it up a tiny bit put it out into the world, it would sell stupid numbers, because there's a lot, I say this every time I bring this up, there's a lot of people that have never played 3, and there's a lot of people that have never played New Vegas. I'm not saying that this is going to happen, but since we're talking about replaying these classic games, I really want to stream Fallout 1. And I know I always say that, but I really, really, really want to stream it. I spent like an hour and a half, last weekend was rough for me. I spent an hour and a half last weekend at like 2 a.m. setting up OBS, and then I went to bed, and then the next day came, and then as soon as I knew it, the next day had gone. So now is the time. Like, that's Fallout 1 and 2 and Tactics and whatever, even though Tactics is, like, kind of canon, but it's, like, kind of not canon. Those are games that I think it is totally okay to go watch playthroughs or just read the wiki. But, like, New Vegas 3, most computers are going to play that. Like, even if you... I don't think a Chromebook is going to play it, but even if you have like a $500 PC, I wouldn't be surprised if it would play it. Like a five six hundred dollars PC. I wouldn't be surprised if it would play it and you could get your, your time and your money's worth there. I have some fun lore for you guys today. Something that I wasn't sure if I could do. Not sure if something I should have waited to do, but I think if that sweet, sweet SEO hits... Everything will work out fine. But before I can talk about the lore, I should really thank the Patreon. This show continues to grow and get better because of the Patreon. It's a constant flow of support to Atomic Radio Hour, to the Old Man Vince YouTube channel, to the Old Man Vince Twitch. All of these things that you can give a monetary amount to supports the creative endeavors that I do. The channel, the podcast, all of it, right? So I have to thank some people because there's some people who believe in me and believe that this could be bigger than what it actually is. Where we should all we should all have the desire, and I feel, maybe not everybody feels this way, but I feel like we should all have a desire that we are bigger than ourselves. Um, you know, it's kind of a cliche to say, but we are the universe experiencing ourselves. Humans are beautiful things. And the fact that humans can believe in themselves and the fact that other humans can believe in other humans is even better. So the people whose names are on screen right now, I have to thank, starting from the top, I have to thank the OG Noah. Thank you, Noah. After Noah, I have to thank Marcus. Thank you to Marcus. After Marcus, I have to thank Mellow Millhouse. Thank you to Mellow Millhouse. After Mellow Millhouse, I have to thank Captain Lennox. Thank you to Captain Lennox. And after Captain Lennox, I have to thank lastly, but not leastly, Danish Hound Dog. Thank you to Danish Hound Dog. Like I said, these names are people who believe in what I'm doing. They like what I'm doing. If you like the show and you'd like to support in any way, check out the Patreon from the $1 tier to the $10 tier. There's a bunch of different perks there. The $10 tier, you get to watch these episodes get recorded live every Wednesday. Just about every Wednesday in case something's going on. Every Wednesday, just about at a, about 8.30 Mountain Standard Time. Come check it out. Show it to a friend. Put us on Reddit. I love you. Thank you. 
So every week I ask the Patreon a poll question, and it's usually about two entities, two factions, two people, two quests, two something from the Fallout series, and then we talk about the lore, and the Patreon's voice gets heard because they get to choose what they want to hear when it comes time for lore. Now, I've said it once, I'm going to say it probably a billion more times, Fallout on Prime, the Fallout TV show, is amazing and might just be the best video game adaptation ever. It's better than Sonic, it's better than Mario, it's better than The Last of Us, it's better than Uncharted, but most things are. It is the best video game adaptation I've ever seen. And I really wanted to talk about the lore from the show, and I wasn't really sure how to approach it because it's so new. But it's one of those things that, if anything, we can update it in the future. So I was thinking to myself, how can we do this? Do we do a location? Do we do a character? There's not really a quest, but I could kind of talk about the main theme of what the plot is in a sense. And I just said, you know what? The good, the bad, and the ugly. So if you like the show and you want to hear any sort of lore from the Fallout series, check out the Patreon. Once a week I ask a poll question. The Patreon decides what the lore is based on that poll. And this week's lore, I put it up to three different questions. Would you rather hear about Lucy McLean, Maximus, or Cooper Howard, or as we know him now, the ghoul? And by way of the Ghoulman Entertainment Patreon, I bring you the lore on Cooper Howard, a.k.a. the Ghoul. The ancient Egyptians have a saying. And every time I bring up that the ancient Egyptians have this saying to somebody, apparently every civilization has had this saying. A person dies twice. The first time when they physically die, and the second time when the last person ever speaks about them ever. And that's what's so fun about the ghouls. The Fallout ghouls. You're a person before the war, or hell, even after the war, you get exposed to enough radiation to ghoulify if that's within your own genetics. You will live two lives, essentially. You could be one person, ghoulify, and become another, or just continue as that person, but in a new way, essentially giving you a second story. And that's kind of the story that we have with Cooper Howard. Cooper Howard is a lot of things. A family man, a veteran, an actor, a ghoul, a mercenary, a friend, a lover, a husband, a father, a confidant, a, a communist sympathizer, a jingoist even at times. And I think that's what makes him so compelling. I think the idea that he's like this gunslinger, this hip cool cat who's shooting his way through Philly, these are things that we're drawn to because everybody wants to be the hero. But the things that draw me to Cooper Howard is more about his family. The fact that he lost something and he's desperately trying to find it. So like I said, he's a veteran of the Sino-American War. He was actually a Marine. Uh, and the Sino-American War, just so you know, went from tw the winter of 2066 up until October 23rd of 2077, so 10 whole years. And I bring this up because there's a piece of dialogue that I'm going to read later. Cooper Howard was deployed in Alaska as a Marine, one of the first platoons to wear T-45 armor. He can later meet Bud At. He can, I say that like it's a video game. Later on in the series, he will meet Bud Askins, who worked for West Tech and is now an employee of Vault Tech, and he can bring up a little bit about his past as a Marine. Uh, when Bud introduces himself talking about how he used to work for West Tech, a defense contractor, Cooper Howard will say, Oh, I'm very familiar with you guys. You designed the T-45 power armor. And Bud will say, first of its kind. No, I, I oversaw the rollout. You know, the design flaws were ridiculous, but they look super great. And Cooper will say, I wore the T-45 and we almost lost the great state of Alaska to the Reds. Those design flaws of yours cost a lot of good men and women their lives. He's a very passionate man. He's a very passionate person, Cooper Howard. He's very disgusted, disgusted by Bud Askins. There's another scene, it's in the last two episodes where it shows him going to drop his wife off. We're going to talk a little bit about his wife in a minute drop his wife off at work, and there's Bud Askins, and he's just immediately disgusted by him. When they have the rap party after the commercial for Vault 4, he just, just one, he's like, why is there a rap party for commercial? And 
too, hates the idea that Bud Askins is about to be in his own home. And you know, while we're talking about his family, we should talk about his family. Cooper Howard is a man who loves his child and he loves his wife. At least that's how it's portrayed in the show. His wife, Barb Howard, uh, is a high-ranking official. She's somewhere in the higher rungs of vault tech and he has a daughter whose name is Janie who you we get to meet in the first episode at the beginning of the show as we watch the bombs fall going back to cooper howard's life before the bombs drop after an honorable discharge from the army he pursued a hollywood career now not all but some of his big films that he was in was The Man from Dead Horse, A Man and His Dog, which is a Boy and His Dog reference, which I love that movie. And even in a weird way, he confirmed that on his Instagram. He confirmed that that's a El Harlan Ellison nod because he put the the name uh, A Man and His Dog and then next to it in parentheses, he just put Harlan Ellison. The Man from Calabasas, Under the Covers, Gun and Valley of the Gun. The Man from Dead Horse actually went on to be a smash hit film despite the change in direction for Cooper Howard's cowboy western characters. He lost his usual writer, a man who went by the name of Cadillac Bob, because he was a communist sympathizer. The same day as him filming this famous scene where he where he changes and he shoots the bad guy instead of saving the bad guy they say that the world is changing this is the way the world is going the world is becoming more ruthless of a place he shoots him and he says the line and my spanish isn't the best but feo fuerte y formal which pretty much you have no honor and you're ugly more or less it comes down to. Sorry, I googled it real quick. It literally means he was ugly, strong, and had dignity. And this line, we're gonna come back to it later, kind of follows him a little bit. After he's done shooting this scene for the man from Dead Horse, he would walk across the studio to a different lot and he would shoot a commercial, promotional images, for Vault Tech of him in a vault suit. And there's a point where he's like, you know, I wanna just try something. Can we do a little something? And he gives a thumbs up. And it's implied, it's not known that this is like the thing, but it's implied that this is where the vault boy with the thumbs up, the famous, I'm trying to see, I, I, like I don't have 19 of them in front of me, but I just can't grab one because the whole shelf would be <laughs> disheveled. You know what it looks like. You're a Fall Out fan, you know what it looks like. But it's, it's implied that it is inspired by him doing that. And it's something that would follow him. And even at one point in the first episode, we hear it. Somebody says, it's what you're most known for. And it kind of seems like it haunts him, especially in episode four, when he's walking Lucy to the super duper Mart and he sees a vault tech billboard and he shoots at the vault boy, which is also just a way to intimidate Lucy, but still it's showing his hatred, his disdain for the world around him. He feels like may have the weight of the world being the way that it is maybe resting on his shoulders a tad. He would even shoot a commercial for Vault 4, and this is where he meets Bud Askins when I brought up that dialogue earlier, saying about how he lost a lot of good men and women during the Battle of, uh, of Anchorage, of Alaska. Now, all of this is happening. He's, he's slowly learning about what the world is, is heading towards. There's a huge war. Uh, there's a plague that's going on that they didn't even bring up that someone brought up to me at work. There's a plague. They have yet to talk about the, pl the pre-war plague. Uh, there is a certain point in time where Israel does not exist as a country because it gets nuked off the map. It would have actually been gone at this point in time because by 2277, or excuse me, in 2077 when the bombs fall, uh, Tel Aviv, Israel, is blown off the map uh, in uh, 2053. So it would have been almost, you know, 15 years? Would have been about 15 years since that had happened. Anyway, his wife Barb is slowly rising through the ranks and he's seeing the way the world is and he's growing ever more suspicious and he's trying to stick to his American soldier ways and, you know, keep it the way that he believes is right. There's a man named Charles Whitenife who he uh, had been in some movies with. He's another actor friend of his and they're talking about the way Hollywood is changing. And they're saying that there is a radical wave that is slowly going through Hollywood in the fallout world at this point in time. And he invites him to, to the forever Hollywood cemetery where these meetings, these lectures are be, be, being given out by a Mrs. Williams talking about all of the evils that vault tech is currently doing. And because Charles Whitenife, 
because Charles Whiteknife is his friend, he says, you know what, I'll go for you. We've done a lot of movies together. We've seen a lot of things. He brings up a point about in one of the movies how the Brahmin barons, excuse me, the cattle barons control more political power than the actual politics. And he equates vault tech to that versus the actual politics. At this point in time of the show's recording, we don't know if the if they know what the Enclave is. There's rumors of Enclave. Uh, there's conspiracy theories, much like there's conspiracy theories about everything, but it's not 100% known if Enclave is known by a ton of people. When, he go, when, when Cooper Howard goes to this meeting of intellectuals at the Forever Hollywood Cemetery, Mrs. Williams, who we're never really told what she does, but she, she worked for a company that got bought out by vault Tech, And this research that she was looking into kind of just got swept under the rug to never be brought up again. She lost her job. She gives Cooper Howard this little listening device. It almost looks like one singular Bluetooth headphone. And he takes it and he knows what it is. And he's like, I'm not going to spy on my wife. But guess what? He winds up spying on his wife. We'll get to there in a second. Now, during this time, a rift in, in the Howard household begins. Cooper Howard doesn't like the idea of the way the vaults are. He's like, I went and fought for our freedoms in Alaska, and now you want me to be under the boot heel of Bud Askins? And he really loses it when he finds out that you can't bring dogs into the vault. And he loves his dog. His dog was in a man and his dog with him. Roosevelt is his name. And he's like, you're not, I'm taking the dog with me. I'm taking my dog. And she's like, we can't. He's like, can we bend the rules? And she's like, no, no dogs allowed. They take up resources. And all of this is slowly getting to him more and more, especially when Barb brings up that she sees vault tech kind of as like a family business. And she wants to get their daughter on the vault tech payroll by time she's 15. And Coop's just like, we can't just have a kid be a kid. She can't just exist as a child, as my girl. But in Barb's defense, she believes what she is doing is wholeheartedly for the good of her family. She even makes a point, a statement, she phrases it in such a way where she's like, I am doing my best to make sure we get into a good vault. So she knows that there are good vaults and there are bad vaults. She is well aware of this. She, I believe, and I'm misquoting this, she wants to get them into a vault that is for vault management, which could play into Enclave because the Enclave was behind the vaults and they could see all the vaults, especially from uh, the Enclave oil base off the coast of California. So it might have been that. My running theory is, uh, spoiler alert, Vault 31. Like I said, Mrs. Williams gives Cooper this listening device, and he finally pairs it with her Pip-Boy. And Robco, being the developers of the Pip-Boy, had made a partnership with Vault Tech, so all of the Vault dwellers would have Pip-Boys. And... This listening device could listen in on her Pip-Boy and he does it, just experiment with it. And he listens to a conversation about school and hot chocolate with his wife and his daughter, Barb and, and Janie, and he's disgusted with himself. But the curiosity gets the better of him. And the next day when he drives her to work, he winds up putting the earpiece in and he notices that it only goes so far. And he follows her up to her office and waits there. And that's where Cooper Howard gets the most devastating piece of news that he's ever gotten in his life. He eavesdrops on this meeting between Bud Askins, who's, who's the leader of the meeting, Barbara Howard, who his wife, who is the second in command of this meeting, Robert House of Robco, Leon von Felden of West Tech, Julia Masters of Repcon, and Frederick Sinclair of Big Mountain. And he starts talking about the vaults and how they can sell the vault, the vaults to people, and even House brings up that there is a lot of money to be made in selling the apocalypse. And when someone says, how do we even know that the apocalypse is going to happen? That is when Barb says that Vault Tech could potentially launch the nukes themselves. Now, real quick, because I know a lot of people got upset about this, there's a lot of theories saying that vault Tech absolutely did bomb. For a very long time, I was one of those people who genuinely thought vault Tech had nuked the world. And then I watched an interview with Tim Kaine and TKS Mantis that said that Tim Kaine said it was China, and as far as I'm concerned, it is China until said otherwise. The idea that vault would do this is interesting. I don't think it wouldn't be them, but there's a lot of things. If Barb knew what day the bombs were, bombs were going to drop, why is their daughter Janie with Cooper Howard 
even after the divorce, because they've been divorced by the time you see that, why would she let her daughter out on that day? That's the biggest thing running for me. Now, I'm not sure how canon the next little bit is. I'll tell you when it's over. Sometime after this, they divorced and Cooper Howard was blacklisted from Hollywood because of his refusal to work with vault Tech. I don't know how... I don't know how canon that is. I get all of my lore off of the Nukipedia, fallout.fandom.com, the Nukipedia, if you will. And that's on there. I'm not, I, I don't personally remember hearing that in the show. It's not something that I think is wrong. It's just, I don't remember it. So take that with a teensy tiny grain of salt. Now he gets divorced or at least separated and he has to pay alimony to his child, to his, to his wife for the kid. And he starts taking up birthday parties so he could pay for the alimony. Someone at the party even makes a jab at him and is like, huh, the big Hollywood star is only here so he could pay alimony payments. And like in front of his daughter, so she hears it. And then after that birthday party, during that birthday party, which is another thing, one of my only few gripes of the show, they move the time around. There's no way those kids are eating cake and sodi pops and uh, sugar bombs at six in the morning. No way. And that party seems like it's a little later in the day. So maybe they move the time around. Who knows? Anyway, anyway, actually, it's supposed to be 947 on the East Coast, but I'm not sure if it's the morning or if it's the afternoon and you would think it would be the morning because of Fallout 4, but then they would switch it around a little bit. And if it was in the evening, it would make more sense because of the time of day on the West Coast. These are the small things that I get tripped up about when you're, you care about things. You care about timelines and you care about lore. These are the small things. Janie, the bomb drops and Janie sees it. Cooper sees it. He gets on the horse because he was doing cowboy shows for the kids. Gets on the horse and rides off. You see the bombs going off. You see the destruction of California. And then we flash forward 219 years into the wasteland. And Cooper Howard is still alive. He's over 270 years old. It's never confirmed how old he is. But let's say he's at least 40, 40 or 50. He's in that range. 219 about 270. He's old. The Nukipedia says 270 with a little, little tilde next to it, I believe that's called, the little squiggly mark, which is like the approximate of how old he is. There's a fellow by the name of Dom Pedro uh, who has buried the ghoul in a casket and has a cross like a, like a, like a tombstone with Radaway hooked up, pumping into his casket. And three fellas by the name of... Hancho, Slim, and Biggie come to get him. And apparently Don Pedro has buried him and he'll pull him out every now and again and like cut a piece of him off and eat him. Which, cool. It's some ritual. It's not the first time we've seen some, some sort of pseudo-religious ritual in the Fallout series. It will not be the last. I liked it. Uh, they also described that an easy way to tell between a ghoul and a feral is that ferals can't help themselves around chickens. So I guess they're just eating chickens left and right. Also, now that I think about it, the chicken f guy, maybe he has some sort of feral in him, some ghoul in him, because he was having relations with chickens. Who knows? Just thought of that now. But anyway, the goons pull him out of the coffin, and they say to him that there's, there's, a, there's a contract out there to find somebody. And this is a big one. It could be the last one. One final job. And that's when Coop's just like, or excuse me, the ghoul is just like, I'm not doing this for the money. I'm doing this for the love of the game. And he kills the three and he takes the job on for himself and he heads to Philly. And that's where we see him next. We see him in Philly, in the town of Philly. This is the first time the ghoul and Lucy will meet in Philly. He's waiting on Viltzik, a man who is a scientist of the Enclave who has escaped, which even asks more questions of how did an Enclave scientist escape? Once he's found, there's a little bit of a confrontation. Majun even says, you know, your kind ain't welcome in these parts. Which I think is really interesting that ghouls just aren't welcome. Even if this is believed to be around NCR territory and Daglo would be to the south. And there, that's predominantly ghouls. I can only imagine that Vault 12 wouldn't be too far. But it seems like in this area, at least in Philly, ghouls aren't fondly looked upon. A confrontation happens and he shoots Siegel Viltzig in the foot, blowing his foot off with this like crazy legendary gun that he has. Blows his foot off. Lucy tries to confront him. He thinks it's real cute. And all of a sudden, Maximus 
portraying himself as Titus, shows up and lands. And they get into a bit of a squabble. There's a huge fight. Lucy gets this uh, mechanical foot thing on Viltzig, and they walk him out. And the ghoul continues to fight Maximus as Lucy and the Enclave scientists sneak out the back door. Now, during this fight, Wiltzig also has a dog, uh, CX-404, and the dog has attacked Howard, and he stabbed the dog! Oh, no! Don't worry, the dog comes back. He gives it a little uh, stim pack, and then he's all good to go. And then the dog joins him, and they're buddies. Uh, this is right around the time when they're sneaking out that Maximus is just messing up the ghoul and the rest of Philly. And uh, this distracts him for a while. Maximus will wind up taking down more or less taking down Maximus. He cuts a little cable in one of the neck tubes and it releases all the oxygen and he uh, doesn't really know how to control it and kind of off to the outer skirts of Philly. The ghoul would then follow Lucy and Vildzig and trail them all the way to Siegel's body outside of a, just right next to a CCCP satellite that's fallen out of space, fallen out of orbit. And then he will track Lucy to... Hollywood Boulevard, where a gulper has swallowed the head of Viltzig, and then the ghoul will take her by chain and keep dunking her in the water. Not to torture her, nay nay, but to use her as bait so the gulper will come back and he can get the head out of the gulper. This doesn't really go the way that they wanted it to go. Uh, the ghoul wanted it to go. He winds up getting in a little bit of a tussle with Lucy, but also he winds up getting all of his anti-feral chems smashed. And he says he'll come back for the gulper later because because uh, they have to go find these anti-ghoul chems now. He's like, look, I'll come back for the gulper. It has a slow metabolism. It's going to digest that hella slowly. I will be back. And now for my favorite episode of the series so far, episode four, Lucy and the ghoul walk through this, uh, just, just the wasteland. And you can see Lucy is just not not doing well. She's not accustomed to this. She's very naive. And eventually they pass the West Side Medical Clinic, which is near the California Crest Studios where he shot the man from Dead Horse and the, the vault tech commercials. And he finds an old friend of his, a guy named Roger, crying out his name. And the one thing that I really, really love is that the way ghouls try to not go feral is by shouting out their own name. They try to remind themselves of who they are, but that feralness just doesn't doesn't go away it's 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 in there and it doesn't come out and you just hear i'm roger my name is roger i'm roger over and over again the ghoul goes to talk to roger it's never said it, it's never said if they know each other pre-war or post-war but if cooper howard was a big time film film star and the way he talks to roger is very much he asks him he goes you remember what what it was like when food tasted good and then roger starts talking about his mom so i can only assume that they're both pre-war ghouls it's one of my favorite scenes in the entire series so far is the humanness, the humanity between two ghouls. One guy who had it all and this other guy who may have just known him as an actor or maybe they knew each other outside of him just being an actor. And Roger even goes, hey, do you have any, any medicine on you? Do you have anything that's going to help me from going feral? And the ghoul's like, "I no, I'm looking for some myself. And then he goes, remember how good the food tastes? And there's a point where Roger looks over at Lucy to tell Lucy about his favorite meal that his mom made. And that's when the ghoul kills him. In a bit of mercy. He takes pity on him and he allows his last few seconds to be those with a smile on it. Like, it's, it's, it's a moving scene. Like, I've talked to everybody about the show, this scene in particular. I love ghouls. <laughs> I've been, like, Ron Goulman is my guy. Like, the, my, my, my character for D&D, like, I love that. There was one time we were playing, and we spent 45 minutes because I had a conversation with another ghoul about the pre-war times and how much I missed it. And I believe we talked about when cigarettes weren't stale. I love ghouls. I love the humanity that's still in them, that is, is sticking around inside of them. I love this scene. And then... The, the duality of the wasteland, when you get these little human moments, you then have to be a monster. Cooper flips him, the ghoul flips him over and takes his pants off and starts cutting his butt cheeks up and he makes ass jerky out of him. And Lucy's like, why did you do that? He was your friend. And like, she doesn't even understand that what he did was merciful. What he did arguably is the right thing to do. Now they start heading back towards the super duper mart. Lucy doesn't know that that's where they're going, but that's where Cooper's taking them. And because of him doing this, uh, 
she needs to drink. They're in the hot sun and he drinks out of his canteen and she looks at him and he kind of like pours out the last bits of his water and uh, he eventually makes her drink irradiated water. He's a ghoul. The rads don't affect him. So he dips his water in this puddle that's like sitting in a hollowed out piece of car and fills up his canteen and Lucy drinks from and he's like, yeah, you're getting it. That's how it works out here. And she goes, what are you? After drinking the irradiated water, Lucy starts to get sick. You can see she starts to get sick and Cooper goes into a, a fit of coughing. The ghoul goes into a fit of coughing because the anti-feral chem is slowly running out and he needs more. She uses that as an opportunity to run away and they get into a bit of a fight and then she bites his finger off and he is now sans a digit. He keeps the digit, but he sans it on the hand. And they wind up going a little further on. After that happens, after the biting of the finger, he lassos her up, pulls her in, takes out a big machete, and just slices Lucy's finger off. And he goes, I'm you. Just give it some time. This is the most fair exchange we've had yet. And just chucks the finger. They go to the Super Duper Mart. She's bleeding profusely. And he goes to sell her to the Super Duper Mart. And he goes, I have one female in almost pristine condition. I want two months worth of anti-feral medication. He then passes out because he needs the anti-feral medication. And a few hours later, Lucy emerges and throws the meds at him. And he goes, she goes, golden rule, mother. Hooray. She makes a big point that she wants to still abide by do unto those as you would do unto others. And on the, in the wasteland, that doesn't happen. But Lucy's a dweller. She's a vault dweller. She's a vaulty. She's blue. And... She doesn't understand the way the world works yet. But she's learning. And I love her. The ghoul would then go into the Super Duper Mart, seeing that everything's gone. He starts taking all the chems he can get his hands on. He's drinking anything he can get his hands on. Uh, I think, I think honestly, he just needed liquid. I don't think the booze would really do anything to him. But he sees that there's a set of tapes, hollow tapes, video hollow tapes, and he plays one, and it's his old video. It's an old movie of him. And it's him saying feo fuerte y formal once again which again means he was ugly strong and had dignity and i think that line comes back to kind of haunt him like he kind of sees that's what he is now in the worst way like he's ugly he's strong but i don't think he has the dignity that he once had after being in there for a spell taking the chems that he needs the sheriffs of the government, G-O-V-E-R-M-I-N-T, show up and uh, take him off. And while he's being interrogated, uh, they want to put him to death for taking out a legitimate business. The government was dealing with the Super Duper Mart, who was a body harvester. They were selling organs and selling other body parts. They had a bunch of people and ghouls that were just in coolers. They want to punish him. He winds up getting the upper hand, killing the sheriffs, and it's just the guy in charge. And he sees on the wall a wanted poster for Maldova, who to him is Miss Williams. And he's trying to find out why she looks so different and how she's alive this 219 years later. He would then go on to find some iron farmers that he would interrogate while they're wearing NCR combat ranger armor, turning out that one of the fellas he killed in Philly is the brother, the older brother of these guys, trying to get information on what the note on him had to say about Maldover, trying to find the location of the Griffith Observatory. He would then find CX-404, the dog, that Thaddeus just put in a... He doesn't know this, but Thaddeus put him in like a nuka cola locker and I... Just seemed kind of mean, man. Once he got to the observatory, though, that's when the Brotherhood and the NCR war begins. Another little battle in their ongoing feud happens. And he's incredibly influential. There's a few sets of power-armored soldiers that are there. NCR soldiers are fighting. The Brotherhood is fighting. But the ghoul is there. And there's a scene where he goes, you know, I, I knew a lot of people, and I'm paraphrasing this, I don't know if this is an exact quote, he goes, I knew a lot of people who wore these suits, and they had a welding issue right about the breastplate. He goes, I wonder if that's still there, and just takes them out one by, not all of them, but a couple of them in this room, just takes them out, and he hits the guy, and you see a spurt of blood fly, it's really, really dope. He's actually a big reason why the Brotherhood didn't immediately take the <laughs> take of the Griffith Observator Observatory. And then he sees Hank McLean 
outside of the cell and a Maximus who is on the ground, unconscious. And he explains that Hank used to work for his wife. He was one of his wife's underlings. And he asks him, he goes, I'm going to ask you what I've wanted to know for the past 200 years. Where is my family? And he explains that once he heard that Lucy's last name was McLean, it could take him to Hank. And then Hank gets away and Lucy's like, yo, you didn't just kill my dad. And he's like, I need to know where he's going. And it's easier to track a stuck pig than it is to kill one. It's going to take me where I need to be. And that's kind of where it leaves us for season one. That's all we really know about the ghoul. We don't, well, honestly, we know more about Cooper Howard than we do the ghoul. Like a big reason why I wasn't sure if I was going to do the ghoul or coop is because I didn't know how much of it was just going to be me retelling the story of the show. Pretty much all I have real quick. Like I said, I get all my lore off of fallout.fandom.com. These are some quick behind the scenes things that I thought were neat. The makeup he's wearing is not CGI and it is a practical effect. And if you know me, I'm a slut for practical effects. Walton Goggins is not someone who plays video games. He said multiple times he didn't play the games. Uh, Ella Parnell said that she had played the beginning of Fallout 4 to get a feel for it. But he has not. And he said he wanted to do that so he would be going in it as a fre as fresh eyes, not familiar with the video games. He wanted to give it the shot that it deserves as, as, a, as, a, as a medium of film and not a medium as a video game. And uh, he said he didn't base it off any other ghoul, but very much off of John Wayne and Clint Eastwood. The ghoul is obviously the coolest character in the series right now. Not my favorite of the big three. Not my favorite of the big six, even if you wanted to break it down into smaller or even the big 10. Um, but he's, he's really cool. Like I get it. I get the power fantasy. Like, you know, I have a feeling he's going to be one of those characters where it's like, you missed the point by idolizing him in a few years, but like, he's, he's cool. And I want to see more about, I'm more interested in Cooper Howard than I am the ghoul to be completely honest. It doesn't change the fact that he's super dope, but still. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Let me know what you think about that. Uh, next week is either going to be Maximus or Lucy. So I hope you're excited for that because I sure am excited for Lucy. And that is this week's lore. Hey, everybody. How you been? What's going on? What's new? Bob da bop skip a boo Ha ha ha. Okay, that's I don't know why I did that for as long as I did. I'm sorry. Uh, guys, just a oh, monthly, bi-monthly, tri-monthly, tricentennial. Uh, reminder that you're, you have to take care of yourself. Um, do not burn the candle at both ends. Last weekend I did that and I am still exhausted and I have the opportunity to do it this weekend and I really don't want to. Uh, but I've just hit that point. Someone told me I have a type A personality and I don't know what that means and I felt like it might have been an insult. But I just have to constantly be moving and that's not okay. Uh, if you exist at that frequency, fine. Even if you're constantly moving is playing a video game and relaxing, try to sit down and relax for at least 10 to 20 minutes. And I have a really hard time with that. I worked pretty much, I normally have off, I normally have three day weekends. I work 10 hour shifts and I normally have off Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I went in for overtime on Friday day, Friday and Saturday. And then after that, I went to the gym and the gym has been a two hour experience. I don't know why everyone is still there. We are four months into the year. I thought by now everybody would stop going because they made their new year's resolutions. Turns out I'm wrong. Uh, that's a two hour excursion. I had to go grocery shopping. I meal prep, meal prepping is a four hour thing. By the time the entire weekend had come and gone, it was Sunday. at 8.30. And thank God Gage was streaming in the Discord because it was the only thing that I did for myself this weekend was hang out with some people in the Discord and have a good time. Check out the Discord while I'm talking about it, please. Anyway, what I'm saying is even, you know, I talk about this type of shit all the time, but even if you're tired of me hearing this, just seriously, take a moment, think about who you are, think about where you are, think about what you're doing. Ground yourself. Uh, you know, five things you could see, four that you could smell, three that you could touch, two that you could taste, and whatever whatever the five things that break it down are. I'm never good at that one. I, I don't know. I'm not good at those things. I just know they exist. I'm not a doctor. I'm just a guy with a podcast. I care about you, and I want you to be safe. So please take care of yourself. Take care of the people you love. 
watch the Fallout series again. Play more Fallout games. They're just beautiful experiences. It's really all I have for you this week, guys. I hope you enjoyed. My name is Vince. This has been Atomic Radio Hour. The intro music is by the one and only Shane Ivers, and it's called Feather Duster. You can get all of his free music at silvermansounds.com slash free music. While you're in the description checking that out, check out the Patreon. There's a link down there from the $1 tier to the $10 tier every single week your voice is heard. You have a chance, if you're in the right tier, to watch these episodes get recorded live. There's also a link to the Redbubble where you can get a design that helps further support the show. There's a link down there to the Discord. Check out the Discord, my Twitter, Kyle's Twitter, the show's Twitter, all of it down there. I love you guys. I'll be seeing you next week. Let me know how you're feeling about the Next Gen Fallout 4 update. Everybody be safe. Love you. Atomic Radio Hour Podcast. This has been a production made by your friends at Gulman Entertainment.